Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the, uh, the Future of Telehealth uh, Zoom panel event. It's the first uh, in ProClinical series of, of three events in our digital health series. And um, we're excited to be, to be here with you today uh, and with our panelists. Um, so just to introduce ourselves, um, I'm, um, my name is Claire Perry. Uh, I'm the, the Vice President of, of ProClinical Group and head up our executive search team. I've been recruiting for uh, seven years, five of which have been in the life sciences space uh, and have placed um, all over the world. Uh, we're also joined today uh, by Lewis Rooney, who's helping us on the back end. Uh, he's my colleague in our San Francisco office. Uh, Lewis is a recruitment consultant and he's spent the last two years solely focusing on uh, digital health and telehealth recruitment. Uh, to introduce ProClinical quickly, um, so we're uh, global growth partners to uh, the life sciences space, uh, which is a sole focus for us. We're headquartered out of London in the UK uh, and have offices in the US, Europe and Asia Pacific. Our San Francisco office does a lot of work in the digital health space um, and we place talent from individual contributor through to C-suite and board level uh, with our executive search brand. So um, ProClinical uh, really wanted to put this on today um, just to, to add some value to, to the life sciences industry with all the changes that are happening uh, with the adoption of telehealth and COVID. Uh, and felt that it would uh, add a lot of value. Uh, we're, we're lucky to be joined today uh, by our special guest, um, Chad Adams. Chad's the CEO of Medic Life. Uh, he's spent the last 25 years developing and commercializing new medical devices and diagnostic devices that improve the delivery of healthcare and progressively move it from point of care to the point of need. Uh, we're also joined by Troy Barring. Um, Troy has more than 15 years as a general manager and VP of sales and marketing for Fortune 500 companies. Um, Mr. Barring has board experience at five private organizations and two nonprofits. And previous leadership roles include a COO at Avita Medical, a GM of Baxter Healthcare and Boston Scientific, and worldwide VP at Johnson & Johnson. And last but not least, uh, we're also joined by Britt Gould. Uh, Britt has 25 years developing, launching, and driving growth in technology, uh, digital health, and therapeutic and diagnostic medical device companies. He is currently the VP product marketing at Echo uh, and has held previous marketing roles at iRhythm, Boston Scientific, and startups. So I'm going to um, hand over now. Um, to these guys to talk a little bit more about themselves so you can get to know them. Um, Chad, would you like to start us off? Sure. Thank you, Claire. And first of all, I'm honored to join you today and also be on the panel with uh, uh, Britt and Troy as well. So as Claire mentioned, uh, my name is Chad Adams. I'm currently the CEO of uh, Medic Life. It's located uh, here in Utah. Uh, spent the last 25 years really focusing on developing, commercializing uh, new, not only medical devices, but uh, diagnostic systems to you know, improve healthcare outcomes. And I would say more importantly, move it from the point of care, so the brick and mortar to the point of need, which is uh, very pertinent for what we're talking about today with uh, telehealth. Uh, this also included two startups, uh, one to acquisition, the, the second to IPO. Uh, of course, spent a long career uh, helping turn around and incubate new businesses inside of Beckton Dickinson and Company, which is obviously a very large company, uh, before uh, recently deciding to jump back uh, to the startup life here at Medic Life, uh, which uh, is actually a, a, what I consider a key enabler for advancing uh, telehealth. So maybe just a little bit about Medic Life. Uh, it actually began as a research project uh, within Hall Labs, uh, which is a successful uh, technology incubator uh, here in Utah with over 700 million in technology exits over the past uh, five or six years. Uh, after you know, sitting in this development uh, incubator, they just finally decided to move it, uh, move it out as a business. And I was asked to be their CEO, uh, given my background. Uh, Medic Life is, uh, for, for better words, it's actually a smart toilet. Uh, 
It provides the world's most advanced remote patient monitoring uh, platform for chronic disease and early detection and manage, uh, management. It's simple, automated, passive, and extremely user-friendly. Uh, here at Medic Life, we believe prevention through early detection is the best cure, uh, but the solution, especially for this space in telehealth, must be simple, uh, convenient, and really fit into a person's daily life. And with every flush of a toilet, uh, critical medical data is, goes down with it. So Medic's AI platform turns that waste into wellness by tracking over 50 biometric and physiological bioindicators. It trends and manages that data to really proactively alert patients and their physicians of important changes in their health. So that, that's, that's enough about me. Uh, again, I look forward to, uh, to the panel discussion So later today. Thank you, Chad. Um, Troy, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, and again, thanks, Claire uh, and Pro, uh, Pro Clinical for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, I have more than 25 years of uh, medical device and form of experience. I've also had the privilege uh, to be part of some great teams uh, that have launched breakthrough technology, such as uh, stents, drug eluding stents, uh, intravascular ultrasound. Uh, 3D anatomical mapping for the treatment of atrial fibrillation, and even spray on skin for burns. Uh, most recently, I've served on uh, two boards for um, wearable technology companies. And the goal of those companies uh, was to take um, traditional wearable devices that are just focused on monitoring and diagnostic to bring uh, therapeutics to bear, which really improves the quality of life and the point of where, where you can get care. You can actually get it by wearing something versus going into the hospital or just telling their doctor something wrong. So I'm super excited to be on this panel to talk about telehealth because I believe that has a huge impact to lower costs and also improve quality of care. So again, thanks for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Troy. And Britt, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you again for having me and all of us and uh, thrilled to be here with you, Troy and Chad. D telehealth is it's an exciting place to be and there's a certainly a huge need for it I know we'll we'll go into it as a panel and it's one of the things that brought me to echo just a, about a couple two three months ago uh, to help place where where this fits and where we are echo started out as a digital stethoscope company I mean it looks like a stethoscope but it has additional capabilities so really starting with the point of care uh, how can we help improve care at the point of care for let's say almost any care, but certainly cardiopulmonary care. And as we bridge from point of care to adding in telemedicine and remote capabilities and live streaming, there's so much that providers can do in person that it's kind of hard to do when you're not in person. You can't necessarily put a stethoscope on a patient, for example, and, and listen to them. And that's how starting with point of care, moving into adding telehealth, it's helping providers provide that care, whether it's in person, whether it's remote, we can talk about examples of that, or whether it's in the home. Um, and again, it's things like the stethoscope, or it's the the newer one, sort of a more consumer looking duo uh, that also has an ECG on it. And so being able to provide high quality care wherever those patients are, help them get access to that care, um, it, it, it makes it a very exciting space. And go further into beyond the visits to um, caring for patients over time, monitoring, managing, so much potential there. So thank you, Claire. Thank you, Britt. Okay, so we're gonna move on now and uh, talk a little bit about what, what um, telehealth means and the definition. So as you can see here, this slide represents the broad landscape of the telehealth space. Um, telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, medical alarms, and M Health, and all of the companies that are working to develop products in that space. Um, to avoid amb uh, ambiguity, we thought it was important um, to, to provide a definition uh, for telehealth. Uh, so what is telehealth? Telehealth is the use of digital information and communication technologies, such as computers and mobile devices, to access healthcare services remotely and manage your healthcare. These may be technologies you use from home or that your doctor uses to improve or support healthcare services. So traditional care settings um, were hospitals and outpatient 
ambulatory surgery centres and urgent care. Um, and with the adoption of telehealth, this is expanded to the home. And then with that, um, let's move on to, uh, to the panel discussion and, um, and start with, with the first question. Uh, so the first question is, is telehealth here for the long term or is it, a, is it trending because of COVID-19? Uh, Troy, would you like to start us off with this? Sure, Claire. Thanks for asking. Uh, that's a great opening question. And uh, first, let me say there's nothing like uh, unmet need to, to really drive adoption and change behavior. And I think that's what we have with the COVID-19. Uh, I believe that telehealth is here to stay. Uh, I think once you've had a chance to use uh, something that provides convenience and quality, it's very difficult to go, to go back. And I think one of the things that if people haven't had a chance to look, uh, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, they have a great website that over the last several months they've updated that they go through great length to pr uh, promote telehealth. Uh, so one of the things that they tell patients is that you might actually be surprised at what you and your doctor can agree on uh, that actually supports you using telehealth. So they uh, give examples of uh, you know, wellness visits, um, getting your prescriptions updated, uh, eye exams even, skin. I mean, there's so many things you can do with telehealth. And even more importantly, things like urgent care, whether it's uh, you know, back pain, um, urinary tract inf infections, or just common rashes. Uh, there's so much that you can, you can do using telehealth. And uh, the fact that uh, HHS is promoting it, I, I don't see that this is just a trend or, or a fad because I think people are gonna see the quality and decide if they don't wanna go back. Thanks, Troy. Um, Britt or Chad, do you have any uh, anything to add on that? Sure. From uh, adding to that, from talking with uh, our customers and, and hospital systems and nursing facilities in the industry, they're giving very similar answers, and their answers range anywhere from ten to sixty percent, depending on on who you ask, and um, it, it's driven by, as Troy says, being able to provide that care. Uh, being able to give that access to care. And uh, in many cases, because the patients prefer it, in some cases, cases of the patients are more at risk uh, because they need it. It may be difficult for them to travel to go get the care or in more rural uh, settings, being able to access care that would be hard to get to otherwise. So I agree with Troy's point. It certainly got accelerated and um, in some way, shape or form, it's very likely going to stick around. Thanks, Britt. And let's move on to how has COVID-19 changed the outlook of telehealth? Um, Chad, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. Yeah, if you think about it, uh, since COVID hit, it's been a crazy year for us all, but uh, since really we were advised to stay at home uh, to reduce the risk of exposure and in some cases, access to, to traditional health care was shut down. We didn't have it. It really, uh, it really made a change in, in the, way, the way healthcare is provided as well as really where telehealth fits in. Especially when CMS announced the additional temporary rules and waivers that expands the scope of Medicare uh, telehealth services. It made it easier for most types of providers to offer a wider range of services uh, to beneficiaries across the country. And it also had an immediate and a dramatic increase in the overall telehealth uh, services. I saw a statistic that said before these rules were in place, this is literally a week before, there's approximately about 13,000 beneficiaries and fee-for-service, uh, you know, Medicare received, uh, that received telemedicine in a single week. Uh, two weeks after that, and it's continuing to grow, is 1.7 million per week. Uh, and it's, like I say, continuing to grow. So. Uh, these are uh, transformative changes, you know, unleashed, you know, of course, over the last several months, uh, you know, not to mention uh, what's uh, the prior question, the convenience and the accessibility, you know, to patient. It's really hard uh, for me to imagine that um, uh, merely reverting to the way things were before is even going to be possible. I think it's, it's definitely accelerated to telehealth, and I think it'll continue to do so. Thank you, Chad. Um, is, are there any other comments on that? 
I was just going to add that uh, part of what I've seen with uh, more telehealth is uh, just like what Britt talked about and, and Chad obviously alluded to is more apps that support it. So there's more of an invested in, uh, investment in digital health. People are being more innovative. And uh, even before my, my dad passed away a couple of years ago, he was able to use telehealth with his, his, uh, his phone. You know, so you could take his phone. The apps are a lot simpler if you're older. And I think the uh, accessibility and the technology and obviously the need, like, uh, like Chad said, is driving more adoption and more use. And it's going to be hard to go backwards. So um, I think the outlook, outlook for telehealth is, is pretty strong going forward. Thank you, Troy. Um, next question, what is the goal of telehealth? Uh, Britt, would you like to take this one? Sure, thanks, Claire. Uh, it's a great question because it's such a broad, can be such a broad term from, as we had to uh, during COVID and the pandemic, leave, let patients stay at home and still be seen by a provider remotely. Um, and it, it spans all the way from care at home with to call them synchronous visits directly with the provider, care at home with um, not not live, but having the patient be monitored um, and only see the provider as needed. Sort of examples that we saw of that with the Teladoc Livongo merger from a couple weeks ago, and a lot of use in let's say clinic to clinic. Um, it could be we're seeing patients in nursing facilities being seen by providers or specialists remotely patients in more rural settings going into a local clinic and being seen by a specialist who's nowhere near them. And so there are so many different ways to, to, to apply this uh, for, to, to improve care and efficiency. And you showed the, a list of companies um, uh, earlier that have been doing this. And it, it's, it's something that has been allowing uh, companies who've been focused on trying to provide better care through digital health technologies or a variety of technologies and extend that. Um, I mean, the two most recent ones that I've been involved in echo right now with the digital stethoscopes with AI enabled screening to help screen things earlier. Now you can do that at a distance. Previously at iRhythm where we had a, a wearable uh, ECG monitoring device that a patient would just go home and wear. It's, there are many different forms of telehealth beyond just the video visit, um, all driving towards better care. Thanks for that, Britt. Um, Troy or Chad, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think he summarized it well. Okay, all right, good. Um, so then how does telehealth structurally drive costs down and if not, does it increase accessibility? Troy, do you want to lead on this? Sure, thanks, Claire. Uh, I, I would say even before COVID uh, hit, I think the US is, uh, is recognized for having some of the highest healthcare costs and, and with the industrial nations. And so if you look at how much we spend versus the benefit, it's, you know, there's a gap there, right? So I think in the US, our life expectancy is about 70, 79. If you look at the other top 10 high income countries, it's, uh, I wanna say it's uh, between 82 and 84. So there's a gap there. Um, the Journal of American Medical Associations, they said one of the biggest reasons why the US has high costs compared to these other countries is that we have a much higher administrative cost. So uh, the numbers that they came up with were about 8% of our costs is related to administrative costs, where if you look at the other uh, top 10 high in, uh, income countries, it's between one and 3%. So that's a, a big delta. And the benefit you have with uh, telehealth is you have the chance to actually lower that administrative cost. So for those that had a chance to look at my background, I had early in my career before I got into sales and marketing, I had an operations background. So I had the chance to work with global facilities. And as part of how we lowered costs and leaned things out, we had a lot of standard, standardized procedures and processes a lot of what you can get through telehealth as far as how doctors interact with their patients for uh, the most common conditions. So I see uh, structurally that the cost coming down. And then I think more importantly, uh, in the US, one of the big barriers that create, creates inequality for healthcare is the cost of healthcare. So imagine if you could have a lower healthcare cost or at least the basics being delivered at a lower cost, you can, you can address some of the inequality that you have with healthcare. 
so I, I see both of those things, um, you know, both uh, costs coming down lower for healthcare, as well as the inequality being improved by having telehealth as big drivers for why that telehealth should keep moving forward. So, you know, that's kind of my, I'm going to say biased opinion, but I'd love to hear uh, both what Chad and, and Britt have to say about that. Yeah, I think yeah. The, um, the, go ahead, Chad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, please. The, um, I, I, I think that's right there. It, telehealth does bring opportunities to bring efficiencies um, that ultimately do affect cost. And to, to look at it one way, um, I think I'm either backing up or maybe a very related angle here. It's the, the things that, that are working best certainly provided clinical value and in a way that's efficient, fits the workflows, it's, it, it works well for the institutions ultimately to, um, to, to, to allow them to provide good care at, at the right cost. I think you put it well, just a, a minor add there. Yeah, the only thing I would add to it is if you just think about a, a normal primary care physician, how hard it is to get in to get an appointment, uh, first of all, but then they maybe can see 15 to you know, 1,700 uh, patients you know, per primary care physician with connected health and with uh, the, the, the mobility platforms that allows them to significantly in, increase the number of, of patients they have, and more importantly, I uh, have more more data, more you know, more focus to uh, you know provide uh, feedback to their patients and actually improve their overall well-being and and uh, you know the overall quality of care. It's even from the physician standpoint. Thanks. I think there was one more thing I was going to add, Claire, uh, and that is for some of these rural uh, counties. And so for a lot of the specialists, a lot of times if you have to travel someplace, uh, that time basically is lost time. So. Anyone that's been someplace where you've got to drive two or three hours, all that time could be recouped if you actually have technology that allows you to uh, provide support or clinical, you know, uh, assessments without actually spending those two or three hours lost lost driving. So there's there's a, a big opportunity to make sure that there's more healthcare, even if you're remote or in a rural place. And Claire, it feels like we keep uh, pulling on threads on this question here. Uh, adding to that too, there's the downstream benefit of it in the sense that when, when you can provide care to the patient and not have to make them travel or to Troy's point or worse be admitted, then this can reduce unnecessary admissions, readmissions, emergency department visits. When needed, absolutely those need to happen. But if they didn't really need to occur and we can help prevent them, that helps to save cost right there. Thanks, Britt. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, Chad. Um, then I would just I just wanted to, to say to everybody out there as well, and we're getting some questions coming through. Please keep um, posting questions and, and we'll make some time um, to answer as many of those as we can at the end. Um, with regards to preventative illness, um, what is the impact on telehealth to reduce cost? Um, Chad, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Yeah, great question. Actually, and it's uh, springboarding off the last uh, last discussion. So, if you think about our just in the U.S. alone, about seventy percent of our healthcare cost is is preventable illness, uh, and unfortunately, our current healthcare system isn't isn't set up to you know to capture those. And to really understand how telehealth is going to have an impact on it, we really have to understand the the problem. And so, you know. One of the biggest challenges uh, to solving the problem is closing the gap of individual health awareness. Uh, again, current healthcare systems uh, can't seem to catch. Uh, just a couple of examples of those is you know most people don't know they have a preventable illness until it's too late. Um, there's it's the, the CDC stats that everybody knows, but you think about a few of them. So in the U.S. alone, there's about 88 million or 35 percent of all U.S. adults are pre-diabetic. Uh, eight in 10 people don't know they, they have it. Uh, one of the biggest killers for both cardiovascular disease as well as uh, stroke, think around hypertension, uh, 116 million uh, U.S. adults have it. That's almost half the population are hypertensive and five in 10 don't know they, don't know they have it. 
And as, as most people know, if you have either one of these, you're more than likely going to get chronic kidney disease. Uh, that's about 15% of all adults. And even worse, nine in 10 people don't know they have it. So that, that's the real problem that uh, traditional health care is, you know, is having a hard time uh, catching if you're only going into your physician once a year for a checkup and having your blood pressure taken once and you just don't have the, uh, you know, the information to be able to make an impact on it. If individuals knew early enough, you know, then obviously they could prevent it by working with their care provider, develop a course of treatment plan to prevent it. And, you know, as, as uh, we say, our, our logo, uh, logo here is prevention through early detection is the best cure. So if people know about it, they have a chance to do something about it. That chance to do something about it. They're not. They're not having to go into hospitals. They're not having reoccurring hospital visits. They're not having to go in. Uh, the prescription burden. The you know the, the overall everything driving that seventy percent of healthcare costs can be uh, can be pre prevented. And so this is where telehealth really can have the greatest impact on on solving this this spending problem. You know, you just think about it. The use of remote patient monitoring. It really empowers patients and physicians with the data needed to catch diseases early and actually do something about it. So if, if you think, uh, you know, not only that, but once you do get on a treatment plan, it also gives them the ability to be able to monitor its effectiveness. So if they were going to uh, go on it, whether it's just exercise or, uh, you know, if they put them on a prescription for, for example, pre-diabetic, they can actually see if it's, if it's effective, if their blood sugars are are managed if they're taking their, you know, if they're taking their medication, and if not, they can they can at real time can can uh, work with their patients to do something about it. So I, that's how I think it's going to ultimately position uh, telehealth ultimately position to have a big impact on the overall healthcare costs. Sorry, thanks, Chad. Is there any other input on that? Yeah, no, I was going to add, uh, you know, Chad's observation, I think, was very important and very critical about uh, prevention and how 70% um, of our health care costs are preventable. So, I, you know, I think about this, uh, and a lot of this has to do with insurance companies. And uh, if you look at all the big companies, they have an investment in well, uh, wellness programs for their employees because they want to reduce or uh, they're trying to lower their health care premiums. And I think if if uh, most people took the same handbook out, out of uh, how in car insurance people approach their um, drivers, we could lower our costs as well, right? They have, just like you said, they have monitoring for, for safe drivers, right? No one thinks about that, but they're thinking long-term. And I think unfortunately, most of our healthcare is focused on short-term versus long-term, which is why prevention and telehealth making it easier for people to see patients uh, kind of avoids that, well, I don't want to make an appointment. I don't want to do this. It's too time consuming. It, it becomes so much more convenient to have a short visit. And so your doctors can see how you're trending and see how you're doing. So um, a lot of preventable illnesses, I think it would be inexcusable that you didn't set up a telehealth appointment before uh, your one year or your two year follow-up, like you said. So I think it's a, it's a lot easier, a lot convenient, and we would be running out of excuses of how to better take care of ourselves. Thanks. Great points. And another an, another view on that one, too, is interesting seeing as we shift gradually more to, from fee-for-service more to value-based care, institutions that have ACOs, uh, accountable care organizations, two of the place, or some of the places that they're first looking into are the diseases that tend to be very expensive, uh, tend to be very expensive to manage, things like congestive heart failure, COPD. And part of why they're so expensive, it's as Chad and Troy were saying, so often the patients finally come into the system when it's so late and it's progressed so far and it's difficult and expensive to treat. Where they can catch it sooner, manage it earlier, and provide care that helps the patient and ultimately is, will help uh, prevent getting into the very expensive treatments very quickly, treat the patient better and, and manage care uh, and manage costs, excuse me, then that's, that's an interesting other angle to it. Thanks. Thanks for that, Britt. Um, do, do you think, um, Britt, that it will in, improve compliance? Uh, patient compliance? Mm. That's a really interesting question. I think that, I think there are a few things that go into compliance. I think that 
Uh, the, the more this is supported really across the system as the patient experiences it, the more they're going to hear it, not just from their physician, but uh, as I think Troy mentioned from their insurance companies, as Chad mentioned, just getting more exposure to it and, and awareness, I think that helps. I think another aspect of that then is how these programs and systems are, are created. Uh, if they're created in a way that really helps to keep the patient engaged, it's in a sense the difference between there is a program that is just a do it because you know you need to for your own health versus taking a more, to put it one way, consumer design approach to it uh, that makes it more likely for them to be compliant and, and stay with it. Um, there are reasons why so many people get hooked on apps they use, social media feeds they use, uh, translating some of that for good into some of these, um, these systems, these management, these monitoring systems, these educational systems. I think that would help significantly with compliance. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. Um, so we, we finally have reimbursement codes for telehealth. Uh, this gives digital health providers a path uh, there's a lot of discussion about how reimbursement has been extended for telehealth through the COVID pandemic. Um, can you share some of the changes as a result of this? Um, who wanted to take this one? I can start on this one. I mean, if we've, we've talked about several of these uh, as we uh, you know, went through some of the, the discussion points today, but beyond the ter you know, temporary CMS rules for COVID-19 that we already talked about, how this already had a big impact on, uh, on telehealth, you know, and as, of course, I don't think they're going away. There's also a lot of new billing codes and, and probably more importantly, better guidance that were introduced in 2020 that's really providing, or I'd say finally providing a pathway for healthcare to move closer to maybe not full remote care, but, uh, you know, for a lot of disease, probably 80% of the things you go see your primary care physician for, you're you know, able to, to do that. And so, you know, these new billing codes for telehealth and, uh, you know, remote patient monitoring, they really do more to connect the dots between, I'll say, connected care, the world we all live in, uh, and the reimbursement that uh, provides the compensation uh, position. So if you think about, the, you know, just, you know, the changes in the last couple of years, so the devices being used are reimbursed, uh, you know, the device setup, education, and using the equipment is reimbursed. Uh, uh, the, the time spent, and this is monthly, reviewing the patient data is, is billable. Uh, now, you know, virtual check-ins with patients each month, uh, that's also there. And then moving more towards, uh, you know, from your initial definition as well, that transition from care management, uh, even that's, a, you know, a big piece that's changing. So as somebody's coming out of, out of surgery or out of, you know, out of a traditional healthcare uh, you know, system, they're actually reimbursement to follow up with patients uh, within a, a couple of days. And I mean, this is near and dear to me. So even in principal care management for patients, you know, with chronic diseases or high risk conditions, those are also reimbursable now. So, so a lot is, a lot has changed, not only with, uh, of course, the temporary CMS, but I think we're finally starting to move towards, uh, you know, reimbursement uh, that's, that's going to have a, a pretty significant impact. And, uh, you know, especially in advancing telehealth and, uh, like I say, moving healthcare from point of care, big brick and mortar and, and offices to really point of need, which is in the home. Thanks, Chad. Um, did anyone else want to chime in on, on reimbursement? I, I could just add uh, one thing that normally reimbursement is a uh, one of the big drivers and uh, changing behaviors, you know, so I talked about some new technologies I launched early in my career and uh, sometimes just having good clinical outcomes wasn't enough. You also had to have reimbursement, but more important, importantly, you need to have payers say that they're going to pay for it. So, uh, you know, I, my belief is that through this uh, COVID kind of pandemic, insurance companies are going to see that actually the telehealth uh, technology is making it so it's actually lower cost uh, for the for the people they insure. So, you know, something before, as I think Chad said this, there wasn't as much coverage or people had access to it. And now with COVID-19, more people have access. I think insurance companies are going to, payers are going to see that this is a benefit that actually lowers costs in a, the low run and the long run versus 
how they've maybe seen it in the past. So that's just kind of my thinking on it. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Troy. Uh, and I suppose that it's allowing, uh, is it allowing a, a, like a lot of new players into the space now that there's reimbursement codes uh, or, or affecting product development in other ways? Some of the things that, yeah, I've heard that I'm not sure. <laughs> it's definitely a hot spot. That's, I think the three of us are very passionate about it. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, investment going going into this space as well from, uh, from an innovation standpoint. Okay, excellent. Um, and so I'm just gonna open so the next few questions up um, to, to you guys as a group. Um, so there are a lot of elements from a technical standpoint that we need to make telehealth happen. Um, how does this affect accessibility? Who wants to start off with this one? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in uh, here as well. The, uh, I, I, this is, uh, I really think there's three, what I'll call technical headwinds that uh, we need to tackle to really get full adoption. And I, I'd say probably more importantly, accessibility to everybody from a geographical standpoint. And, you know, some of it uh, is, is well underway, but it's, we're not where we need to be overall. And the first is what I call high speed, kind of low latency connectivity support you know, the data video and data streaming demand, uh, you know, for the services as well as the data collection, uh, you know, side of things. So this, this means expanding telecommunications infrastructure and, you know, availability again, regardless of location. If you think about now, I can drive across even my small town where I'm at and, and I have no service on one side and, you know, I have full service in, in another place and, you know, Wi-Fi is no better, you know, so just, the ability to improve connectivity is going to be an, uh, an important component uh, component there. So a couple of the other places is, I'd say also clear privacy and data security standards. Uh, and why this is important in my mind is it allows uh, clinicians to practice across state and across national borders as well. So if you, th you think the shortage of, of physicians uh, or clinicians now, think about the explosion of, of, of telehealth. So the ability to be able to, uh, you know, serve across not just within your own patient uh, patient groups, but also across across borders, I think is going to be important. So that's where, uh, especially across national borders, that's where privacy and data security is very very different, uh, and it's something that uh, definitely needs to be taken on uh, to standardize. And I I think most importantly is uh, it's just more of a compliance standpoint. So simple, convenient, uh, I'd say low cost, even an accurate remote monitoring devices. Uh, where that innovative dollars we just start talking about are going, uh, really that collect more than one physiological indicator. So the ability to have to wear 15 devices to gather the, you know, the physiological indicators that, a, you know, the physician needs, I think is going to be a big, a big, a big driver of that. And of course, is a big focus for a lot of companies right now. And I think, uh, you know, as we continually make progress in these areas, uh, accessibility doesn't matter where you are, that will no longer be a barrier. And I think, again, telehealth is a, is well positioned to have an impact there. Yeah, building off of uh, Chad's points there, and it's the, the side of technology of, um, I think Chad, you mentioned it, it's the accuracy of what you're getting. It's when you need to measure something, is it gonna give you the accuracy you need? Is it sort of a medical grade when needed? Uh, so that you can get the information that you need, even if it's remote. Um, that's an important one to, 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 to help provide the answers. And then there's the, out of the potential flood of information, how do you make sense out of it? And how do you help uh, the right providers at the right time make the right decisions? And uh, opportunities like AI, um, assistance to uh, help them arrive at answers faster are important. Um, and I'd say that a third one then that Chad certainly touched on it as well, it's how does this fit into those who need to use it? Uh, whether it's on the clinician side and does it fit their workflows well enough? Is it easy for them to use? Is it efficient such that they're going to want to use it without adding a whole lot of extra time or effort? And um, as Chad hit on too, obviously the on the patient side, um, is this something that's easy enough for them to, to use and integrate into their life? Um, in, in other words, if it's too drastically different, 
it's kind of hard to get people to adopt it. How do we make it uh, fit, fit their needs and fit their lifestyle wherever possible? Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Britt. Um, and then how much cost is preventable in the healthcare system? If you can have more calls with your physician, uh, will costs go down? Who wants to start us off with this? I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this. And uh, Chad covered this earlier. He talked about how much of our healthcare um, is uh, is preventable. I, I think the number is 70 plus percent. So, you know, again, if people have uh, easier, more frequent access, our costs will go down. If there's uh, better tools uh, as far as uh, ease for high technology companies to be compliant, understand how, what they need to do to get their technology through the regulatory agencies. And then again, I think one of the key things that Chad hit on was um, uh, physician availability. So a lot of uh, 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 physicians can't practice across state lines or it could be difficult, but imagine that you could do that. Uh, so your, uh, your access to experts could be a lot uh, quicker and better. Uh, so I, I see that um, costs could go down substantially if, if those things are in place. So uh, telehealth has, I think, a huge opportunity to lower costs. Thanks, Troy, for that. Uh, any other comments on that? Other than I agree they put it well. Okay, thanks, Britt. And I know, um, Troy, when, when we were talking earlier, you talked about, um, you know, accessibility and, um, you know, some people not having um, Wi-Fi or not having sort of the elements they need to access um, telehealth products. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I, I mean, just so you know, that was a huge discuss, discussion in our household because we talked about uh, availability of access. So most people say, well, everyone has a cell phone. Uh, uh, but if you have a cell phone, the question is, do you have good Wi-Fi? Do you have the ability to use some of the apps? Can you uh, uh, upload the quality of resolution you need to have your, you know, your skin rash identified? Uh, so, uh, so even though the cost could be lower, there's still some infrastructure that needs to take place. And if you don't have those basic things, uh, even though you could be lowering uh, healthcare and they're reducing inequality in places that, uh, like the cities where there's good Wi-Fi and there's more infrastructure, there may be rural places that don't have the same benefits. So, uh, you know, how do you make sure people have that connectivity where they have access to that uh, technology? I think that's, uh, I think that's an open item. Uh, but I think the first thing is having a, a lower cost platform that, that doesn't exist today. And if you have that, you're gonna be able to take a, a big chunk of cost out and then just make healthcare more affordable or more avail available. So you might not be able to get everything at one time, but you're gonna be able to make substantial progress. Thanks think, for that. Thanks for that, Troy. Yes, Chad? I think convenience is gonna drive a lot of that too. So I agree with everything you said, but if you think about, I was just recently reading an article of the, well, let's call it mass migration of of patients from primary care providers to retail health clinics and other things. And you know, the reasons they're doing that is purely convenience. They can, no appointments open 24 hours a day. They can walk in, walk out. There's a CVS within, you know, let's say 10 minutes of every, you know, everybody. So I, I think telehealth really has the same potential as well. So I think that will be an additional driver that will I mean, it'd be more of a market uh, market pull where people who demand more of that convenience will drive uh, broader uh, broader availability. Yeah, and that, that can help bridge the gap, at least in the near term. And, and while there's still many patients who don't necessarily have that direct access to technology, I think as, as Troy was saying, I think Chad's point about access to um, more local clinics does make it easier uh, for, for patients to get that care, uh, whether it's the CBS, the Walgreens, whether it's a, a, a primary care clinic in a more rural facility or rural setting. Um, and some that we're seeing as well is um, hospitals and clinics associated with, say, school systems, helping to bring care to, to students, to the pediatric population who might not otherwise have as easy access to it. Uh, and so much of that 
back to your point, Claire, really facilitated by telehealth and um, helping connect the patients and providers wherever they may be. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Britt. Um, that was great. And um, yeah, as I understand it, there, there was um, some resistance to the uptake of telehealth prior to COVID because um, the payment was less, uh, as I understand it, to doctors and physicians that were seeing patients um, via, you know, the cell phone or, or their computer. Um, and, and I understand now that um, reimbursement is being offered at, at full rate to the doctors um, for using telehealth um, since COVID. Um, have, have any of you seen that change or, or any other changes um, or noticed any, um, any other resistance or, or opening ups um, of, of adoption uh, in the recent times? I was going to add, Claire, that sometimes there's uh, safety in numbers. And so I think most people know when you look at uh, kind of the high income nations, how they practice healthcare. The US is one where they do more defensive healthcare practice, where they'll order more tests, or they'll be concerned that they might misdiagnose something if they don't have the right interface with the patient. But now, because of COVID 19, I feel like everyone's just had to jump into the water and say, we're going to use telehealth. And so you have a lot of people using it, a lot of physicians, a lot of patients. I don't think, uh, my personal perspective is I don't think you're going to have the same potential litigation that uh, physicians and insurance companies may have been concerned with, you know, in the past because um, the pool of people using it is so much uh, broader now. So, I mean, I, I think that might have been one of the barriers besides access that, you know, the U.S. just is, you know, well, I have to see before I sign a test because it won't get uh, paid for this or that. Uh, but I think a lot of that's changed because so many people are using it. The, uh, the, the improved, the, the reimbursement has certainly helped in the sense that um, when, for the period when people sort of the stay at home and did not want to go in to see their doctor, didn't want to go in to see the hospital, unfortunately, as running a business that has hurt uh, a lot of institutions. So the reimbursement side of it certainly did help from that uh, from that perspective. Um, certainly want to provide care everywhere needed at the right cost and being able to be reimbursed and, and, and be um, sort of recognized financially for the care given, that certainly helped. And um, from that point of view, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in the industry are happy to see the, the direction of this very likely staying or at least moving towards becoming more permanent. Thanks for that. Um, I think we're, uh, I'm conscious of time and, and I know that we're, we're getting towards uh, the end. And um, I just wanted to ask uh, you all if you have any other comments um, about just generally about telehealth that you wanted to share. If not, we can move to some questions. Um, we have a few questions uh, from our guests uh, today. So um, this one uh, is a follow-up question for Troy. Um, what percentage of administration structural cost is related to use cases that can be solved with telehealth, for example, diagnostics and remote patient monitoring versus costs associated with administering treatment um, or therapeutics, so, or, or therapeutic surgeries? That is a great question, and uh, I, I'd have to pull up my little chart, but I think most people know that over 30 plus percent of our healthcare costs is what is delivered in hospitals. Uh, I mean, so if you're able to take and drill that cost outside of hospitals, it, that, that number goes down. So I would say a lot of the diagnostic cost is different than just kind of the general wellness uh, cost is being covered as part of telehealth, right? So I gave an example of some of the things that you could you could use telehealth for, whether it was wellness visits, uh, getting your, your medicine prescribed, uh, skin rashes, things that you do for urgent care. So I would kind of separate those two. And then the administrative uh, portion of that is a lot to do with um, just having people come in and out of, out of your office and being more efficient in managing that. So I use you know, my uh, ERP example for a big company, our supply chain, right? Um, if you have standard processes and procedures, 
all your administrative costs are going to be a lot lower because it's standardized across uh, your entire base of operations to include hospitals, outpatient centers, and things like that. So a lot of the administrative costs has to deal with how we deliver um, care, do billing, and other things that would be standardized if we start using telehealth. So I would say they're slightly different, uh, but, but uh, those are the two big things. Uh, administrative costs, and then the biggest cost is obviously the brick and mortar, which I think both uh, Britt and Chad talked about as far as if you can do less in those places uh, and then reduce uh, the higher cost procedures because you are using preventative care, uh, your cost has a chance to go down. Thank you, Sorry. Troy. Yeah, I don't know if Britt or, or Chad might have some additional input on that cost, cost question. I, I don't know. I know it's, uh, I've heard numbers thrown around, but I, I, I'd be, I think I said I have, or couldn't back it up. So. <laughs> in, in a similar spot, yeah, what you said uh, makes perfect sense. And I agree. It's uh, a, a lack for, a lack of uh, specific numbers though to add to that. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for taking that one. Um, do you, here's a, another question is, uh, do you think telehealth would help result in reduction in emergency room visits? Short answer is yes, I think so. And um, certainly it's a combination of both my belief and what we're hearing from some of our customers and folks in the industry in the sense that now maybe right now, plenty of patients are trying to stay out of the, the uh, emergency room still. Uh, but in normal situations, there are uh, a couple things. One is if, if it's something that's not quite as emergent as what needs to go to the emergency department and it can be um, taken care of remotely, that's one approach. And the other approach is what I think a number of us were, or probably all three of us were, were talking about earlier. It's being able to detect, catch, monitor, manage things earlier before they escalate or decompensate to the point where the only thing left is for that patient to go to the emergency department. So I think it's for at least a couple different angles that the short answer is yes, it certainly can. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think, you know, prevention is going to have a dramatic impact on hospital visits and probably readmissions, uh, of course, as well there. But I also think there's an accessibility piece. So I don't know the exact numbers on these either, but the number of people that actually go into an ER, the vast majority of people, high percentage, don't need to go to the ER. They could have went to their primary care provider, uh, uh, you know, or a retail uh, health, you know, uh, hub uh, to get that done. So I think accessibility is really important to that. And why do they do that? Is because usually you can't get into your primary care position, or it's you know, or the hours are you know, the the hours are off where you can't get into the, the places you need to. So they you know, they, they revert to, you know, going to the you know, emergency room. Whereas if you had most telehealth are 24 hours, so you have access, you know, you have access now to, you know, to, to get clinical feedback before you actually go to an emergency room. So I think that'll have an impact as well. All right, thanks. Thanks for that, guys. Um, and then we just, we just had a comment uh, as well. Um, I think one of the major advantages of telehealth is bringing healthcare to people in rural communities all over the world. Uh, and I know that um, Troy spoke a little bit about this, uh, you know, as did Britain Chad. And um, did, did you guys want to expand on that at all? Yeah, I think the only comment I would make is that uh, once you know you can use telehealth in rural areas, there will be more technologies that support that. So uh, I know that I've worked with a company in the past that one of the things they do is allow a pathologist to see things remotely. So you can imagine if you were able to not have to drive two or three hours to be able to make a diagnosis, diagnosis on uh, some type of a cancer margin, you'd actually have a, a system that based on your ability to work it remotely or use telehealth, uh, you can manage that. So, I think as the technology gets better, it, it helps all aspects of remote technology to, to make clinical decisions. 
Yeah, I agree. And in, in very practical terms, we have customers at Echo who are doing exactly that. It's anything from integrated health systems with remote uh, clinics in rural parts of uh, their coverage area and being able to have those patients come in close to home for them. And when they need to, be, to see a specialist, it's just a telehealth visit away where the specialist can see the patient practically as if they were right next to them at the bedside. Um, others where it's, it's maybe more rural clinics associated with um, hospitals or specialists to bring in or get access to the care they would need without having to make the patient go travel a very long distance, potentially a hundred or more miles. So very practical cases where that's happening right now. Yeah, and if I could just add on to what uh, Britt was talking about, a lot of technologies come, has gotten so much lower in cost that you can actually send it to a patient's home, they can wear it. So for example, a uh, uh, sleep apnea study is, I mean, if so, if anyone took a sleep apnea study, uh, study I know 10 years ago versus today, it's like night and day. Right, the technology, you know, your technology, uh, you know, uh, iRhythm, the new company, uh, that's that wasn't available 10 years ago. Obviously, uh, from my atrial fibrillation days, we, you know, we didn't know when people would have an AFib episode. There's just so much more home technology that you can get to people at a much lower cost. If you're a physician, you can treat it remotely because the quality of your data, uh, I think, as you said, this, uh, Britt, is a lot better because you feel more confident as a physician that you're seeing. The same thing you would see if they came in at the office and you use some of your more sophisticated equipment, the home version and the office version are basically equivalent. So you just have more confidence in your diag diagnosis. Yeah, I think there's uh, definitely innovation happening beyond just the remote piece. So there's new business models in telehealth. So uh, if you think about uh, the integration of even uh, insurance. So there's plans where there's a distri distributed net network of, of physicians who come to you, you know, who are actually, not only can you connect, you know, through a telehealth or remotely, but they'll actually have the ability to be able to go to the patient's, uh, you know, patient's home or where they're at to be able to give that service. And they tie it back into even insurance plans where, you know, it's a subscription you, you, uh, you subscribe to and you get access to that depending on the type of disease you get access to that uh, net, network of physicians so i think there's a service model innovation happening that's going to have a big impact on accessibility as well okay thank you uh thanks chad and Britt and troy um i know we've got a couple of minutes left so i just wanted to um say thank you to um our, our panelists um Really enjoyed the discussion, uh, as I'm sure uh, all our all our guests online did. Um, and thank you to everybody who could join today. Uh, if you did have questions that that didn't uh, get answered, or you didn't have time to send them across. Um, there's an opportunity to connect uh, with our panelists. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out to them on LinkedIn. Um, so Chad, Chad Adams, um, Troy Barring, and Britt Gould would, would be happy to connect with you. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about a new career opportunity or growing your team, please feel free to reach out to myself uh, or Lewis. And if you enjoyed this event, um, this is, you know, we're doing another one, uh, which will be the future of telemedicine uh, on September 2nd at the same time, uh, noon Pacific. And we would love for you to join us uh, if you're available. And um, yeah, thank, thanks guys again. Thank you, Claire. And thanks, thanks Claire. Uh, Troy, and thanks, Troy.